Welcome to church. We're glad to see you this morning. We're glad that the weather's cooperating. And it's good to see a Toronto Maple Leafs jersey in the crowd this morning. Amen. God bless Ron Mater. All right. I want to read uh, just a couple of verses from Psalm 119 as we begin this morning. Psalm 119, beginning at verse 89, says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou didst establish the earth, and it abideth. We are thrilled that we have the word of God, that it uh, gives us exactly what we need to know in this day and age, and that we can certainly be encouraged and edified in difficult times through it. And we're glad that you're here this morning. We are going to begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll uh, get Danny up to lead us in a song. Father, we are truly grateful for this opportunity. We thank you for each one that is here, for those who will be coming to the 11 o'clock service. Lord, I pray that you may indeed have your will and way in our hearts. Father, may you be uplifted and glorified. May we leave here a different people than we were when we came. And Father, we will be sure to give you the thanks and the praise, for you alone are worthy. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. We're going to open by singing the chorus to Family of God and Thank You, Lord. <clears throat> Let's 
Amen. Just a couple of announcements. First of all, if you would prefer to listen to us on your radio in your car, you can tune to 89.7 and uh, you should be able to pick us up. Uh, our small groups are continuing as scheduled throughout the week, beginning this evening at 6 o'clock. There's a small group meeting in the church. Our office hours during the pandemic and during the lockdown are Wednesdays from 8.30 to 12.30. Uh, the South Niagara Life Ministries is still having their baby bottle campaign. However, uh, they're not giving out baby bottles. So it is going to be all online, and we encourage you to visit their website at www.SouthNiagaraLifeMinistries.com, and uh, you can donate there, or you can mail in your donation. Uh, and uh, if you need any further information, you can contact the church office, and we will be happy to give you information. Uh, the youth are having a Zoom meeting this Friday at 7 o'clock. Uh, and if you want to attend, please contact the office with your name and email address, and we'll be sure and get you all the details. Our Awana store night was scheduled for uh, just in the near future, but it is being postponed. So our Awana awards and store night will be uh, rescheduled after the lockdown is done, and uh, we'll be sure to email you the information for all of our Awana folks. We are going to continue with drive-in services, weather permitting, so if it's looking like there's going to be thunder and lightning, or if it's a downpour, please stay home in your jammies and watch us online. Uh, we are sad to announce this morning that Lynn O'Neill has passed away this week of COVID. And uh, um, we're not sure exactly the day she passed away. She took a turn for the worst uh, last Friday. And uh, I got an email uh, late in the week indicating that she had gone home to be with the Lord. Uh, Lynn and Russ O'Neill have uh, been to this church several times. Russ has preached here and filled the pulpit. And so uh, we are saddened to hear this news and we would ask that you remember Russ and the boys in prayer. Um, this next announcement is, uh, uh, you may shake your head and say again, but we have another wedding coming up. We have actually three more weddings uh, before we're done this summer. Uh, but one of our weddings that was scheduled for August has been moved up to June. And so we are, because of the fact that they don't need to cancel venues and, and uh, reschedule uh, receptions, they can do that. So uh, Michaela and Richard have moved their wedding up to the 19th of June. And as such, uh, I know that you have given and given for the last couple of bridal showers that we have had. Uh, but we are going to begin collecting next Sunday for Michaela. And so uh, uh, I appreciate so much how you stepped up and be took part in this, these last two showers. And uh, I would hope and pray that you will step up again for these remaining brides, that we can show them the love of their church. And uh, so we'll begin to collect next Sunday, weather permitting. Uh, if we are online, then you can contact the office or my wife, and we'll be glad to give you the information of how you can donate to that gift. All right, I think that's all of our announcements this morning. Remember 89.7 if you want to listen to us on your radio, and uh, we are uh, going to have the ushers at the exits with uh, offering baskets should you wish to donate this morning. Danny. Thank you, Pastor. I think with all these weddings, there must be something in the air. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, we're going to sing There's Power in the Blood. <laughs>
special ministry and music this morning is Rebecca. <laughs> so fortunate. Uh, what an awesome God we serve. And uh, all of this and heaven as well. We are certainly blessed and uh, we're so grateful that we are able to gather together this morning. What a gorgeous day and uh, I tell you what, we've had a gr good stretch of nice weather and I think there's still more to come. So we are rejoicing in what God is doing. Take your Bibles, if you have them with you this morning, and turn to Revelation chapter 15. By the way, I hope you do have your Bible with you. Uh, you ought to have it with you every time you come to church. Now, I, I know that many of you have your Bibles on your phones, and, I, and I, I'm not going to criticize that. 
but I'm an old-fashioned guy. I like to hear pages turning. It's kind of hard to hear when you're sitting in your car, but uh, you know what? It's good to have your Bible with you, especially when you're coming to God's house. Revelation chapter 15 this morning. We're back in the book of Revelation. We'll be here for a little while, and uh, for the, the near future at least, until we're getting either to the end of the book or other things come up. Revelation chapter 15 is probably, uh, and I say probably, but it is the shortest chapter in the book of Revelation. Uh, it's just eight verses, but there's a lot in here. So let's begin to read at verse 1. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And as I, I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and of the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou art holy, for all the nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials, full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Father, I pray this morning as we come to your word that you may indeed take it and bless it to our hearts. May you open our eyes and our understanding. May you help us, Father, to truly uh, understand the importance of the book of Revelation. Help us, Father, as we delve within its pages to learn of what will happen in the future. And Father, I pray that as we learn the lessons of what will take place, that you would place within our hearts a hunger and a desire to tell others of the grace and goodness of our God, that others may come to know him and not have to go through those horrible times. Father, I pray that you'd bless our time together this morning in Christ's name. Amen. Many believed uh, just a few years ago that tsunamis, earthquakes, and financial concerns that were dominating the headlines, that with all of that taking place, we were approaching the end of the world. Uh, what would we have thought a few years ago if we'd known what we were going to be going through in 2020 and 2021? The National Geographic Channel partnered with Kelton Research to conduct a survey gauging what Americans thought about a potential doomsday scenario. And they found the following results. Nearly three out of four people, 71%, envisioned a major disaster in their lifetime as an act of God, not of man. More than 62% of Americans think that the world will experience a major catastrophe in the, less than the next 20 years. Nearly half, 49% of Americans, would forego new high-end appliances in a new home if it had a safe room or bomb shelter instead. We are living in perilous times. We're not so concerned about attacks from an enemy outside of our borders as we are of natural disasters and plagues that are beginning to take place all around us. In these days, there are a lot of people that are running scared. They're expecting imminent disaster. 
And there has been good and bad that has come over the last few years, especially these last, this last year and a few months, as people have begun to ask serious questions about what the future holds and what they can do to prepare for the future. The bad side has been that we have had people who are professing believers that have allowed this pandemic to grip their hearts with fear. And uh, Lord, folks, we just need to be very careful. We need to be careful that we do not go to one extreme or the other, but that we are keeping our focus on the Lord Jesus Christ to the best of our ability. We all need at this moment in time the right perspective. And I believe that's what the book of Revelation is all about. It helps us see our tribulations on this earth from a heavenly perspective. By looking at the great tribulation to come. We are living in difficult times. And that is uh, certainly not going to be argued by many people. But let me tell you one thing. There, this is nothing compared to what is coming. This is nothing compared to the uncertainty, the pain and suffering that will be coming during the time of the Great Tribulation. During those seven years between the rapture of the church and the glorious appearing of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, this world is going to be struck by plagues and pestilence as it has never seen before. Revelation tells us about the reign of a coming world tyrant. And the fires of hell, in Revelation chapter 13 and 14. It describes God's judgment which will be unleashed on this earth. The last seven of which we are just now approaching as we finish up Revelation chapter 15 and then next week get into chapter 16, we will begin to look at the vials of wrath, the bowls of wrath. Revelation, even in the midst of all of the plagues, even in the midst of all of the suffering and the anguish and the pain and the death that is going to be taking place during those seven years, Revelation still invites us to come to God. It still invites us to come to the one who is a God of mercy and grace before it is too late. Revelation invites us to look at our trials from heaven's perspective, to see the future from God's standpoint, understand world events from a divine point of view. Revelation chapter 15 is where we get that divine point of view. When the tribulation begins after the rapture of the church, during those first three and a half years, there will be the seven seal judgments that will take place on the earth. When the great tribulation or the time of wrath itself begins, which is at the three and a half year mark of that seven years, there will be the seven trumpet judgments that will take place upon the earth. And then at the very end or nearing the end of the tribulation period, there will be seven more judgments. The seven bowl judgments or seven vile judgments. The bowl judgments will end human history as we know it. And so today's passage deals with the heavenly preparation for that final seven judgments. This is the preparation that will be made for the launch of the judgments that will end all of the ungodliness and evil that man has brought upon this world. Look at Revelation chapter 15 verse 1 with me. And I saw another side in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. In the midst of the tribulation, we see first of all seven angels, and we see the end of pain. By this time in the book of Revelation, we're coming to the end of the tribulation judgments. The seven bull judgments are just about to begin. And they will come in rapid succession. During that chapter 16, uh, they will come one after the other. 
Now keep in mind that during the tribulation period, there will still be people coming to faith in Christ. There will be tribulation saints that will accept the gift of salvation and will be following Christ and seeking to live for Him in very difficult and challenging times, unlike anything we've ever seen before. Having to meet in our parking lot or online is nothing compared to what is coming for those who accept Christ during the tribulation period. They are going to be experiencing plagues like we have never dreamed possible. They're terrible plagues. But with them, God's wrath will be spent. God's anger will be finished and God's blessing will finally come as Jesus returns to this earth to reign for a thousand years. Now I remind you again that we go through tribulations in this lifetime. We go through times of testing and difficulty and hardship. But nothing that this world can give us at this moment in time is to be compared to what is coming the horrors and the plagues that will one day come upon this world. God's anger will not last forever. During those seven years, we see God's anger poured out and we see judgments poured out. But I believe that even in the midst of those judgments being poured out, it, it is an attempt to get people's attention. It is in an attempt to get them to turn towards God. To accept him as their personal savior. The pain that we go through today is fleeting. It's temporary. It will pass and it will disappear. And so will the pain in the tribulation period. It is only for a short period of time. But the suffering of that time is certainly going to be much more intense than it is right now. Though pain is temporary, the praise will last forever. That's the perspective of heaven. Not only for tribulation saints, but for us as well who go through much lesser tribulations in this life. Psalm 30 verse 5 puts it this way, For his anger endureth but a moment. In his favor is life. Weeping may endure for the night. But joy comes in the morning. In the 1976 Montreal Olympics, a Japanese gymnast by the name of Shim Judimoto broke his right knee during the floor exercises. Most expected him to withdraw from competition. So you can imagine their surprise when they saw him the next day competing on the rings. He was performing well, but everyone wondered how he would handle the dismount. Fujimoto came to the end of his routine and without hesitation, flew off the rings with a twisting triple somersault. There was a, mo a moment of intense quiet as he landed hard on his wounded knee. And then the audience gave him a thundering applause as he stood his ground. Later reporters asked him, about that moment and he replied this way he said the pain shot through me like a knife it brought tears to my eyes but now I have a gold medal and the pain is gone folks that's the way it's going to be for every believer we go through times of testing and hardship during this life and it seems to last for so long and it seems to be so difficult and we sometimes long for the morning. We long for that time when we will have peace and quiet and, and serenity once again. But our trials last but for a short season. But our praise and our enjoyment of God's blessings will be forever. We have much to give praise and glory to God over. Even in the times of testing, even during times such as this, God is doing some incredible things. Folks, I wish I could spend a morning and just tell you all of the things that God is up to, even in this small body of believers. 
but he is moving and working in people's hearts and lives like I've never seen before. And I am excited to see what God is doing. And I'm excited for us to be able to get back into our building and begin to worship God again together rather than in a parking lot viewing each other through our car windshields. But God is doing something in these days. And as hard as it may be and as hard as we think it is and as difficult as we feel it is in our own personal lives, God is up to something exciting. The second thing I think we see in chapter 15 is a sea of glass and the peace that is ours even in the pain. As children of God, we need to be calm and secure in the sovereignty of God. Look at verse 15 with me. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. These that are listed here are the tribulation saints. These are they that have trusted Jesus Christ during the tribulation period. These are those that have refused to accept the mark of the beast. They refused to bow down to his image. They refused to do anything to obey or adhere to what the beast was trying to do. We find the mark of the beast described for us in Revelation chapter 13. As a result of this, many of these tribulation saints... In fact, I would say most of them will not make it to the glorious appearing of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the beast will kill them. And from earth's perspective, it will look like Satan has won. But from heaven's perspective, they are described as those who have conquered the beast. Even when God's fiery judgment is flashing all around us. Like these tribulation saints, we can be secure on a sea of glass. We can be at peace. We can be calm and unafraid. As we keep our focus on the Lord Jesus Christ instead of my circumstances. It's like Daniel resting in the lion's den at night. While King Darius is unable to sleep in his satin sheets. That's the way it is for those who have put their trust in Jesus Christ. We can laugh at the lion that is roaring. We can be at peace and secure even with the fire of judgment all around us. And more than that, we can sing praises to our King. Revelation chapter 15 verses 3 and 4. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou art only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. Even though they have been going through the great tribulation. Even though they have experienced horrors that we cannot imagine. They are praising God. They are exalting Him. They are announcing that His ways are right. There's no hint of any complaints at all. There's no one saying, God, why did you allow this to happen? Why did I suffer so much? And why did you allow your people to be tortured and killed? They have no questions for God because their questions have been answered in heaven. From heaven's perspective, they see that God's ways have been right all along. And they are singing the praises of God. My dear friends, that's what we're going to be doing in heaven one day. We're going to be singing the praises of God. And though it is difficult for this moment in time, joy comes in the morning. And the morning is fast approaching. 
We will sing his praises because we will see that his works are remarkable. Verse 3 says, Great and marvelous are your deeds. God's deeds are amazing. They're beyond our human comprehension. Augustine, the great 5th century theologian, was strolling the beaches of the Mediterranean Sea one morning. And he was engaged in deep thought. He was trying to understand the nature of God. Then his thoughts were interrupted when he saw a little boy running towards the ocean with a bucket. He watched the boy fill the bucket with water and ran back up the beach to pour that water into a hole in the sand. Within seconds, the water was gone, soaked into the sand. Again, the little boy went down to the ocean with his bucket and filled it with water and ran back to the hole and poured the water in. And again, the sand swallowed up the water. Augustine approached the boy with a smile and asked him, What are you trying to do? Little boy, a little annoyed at the interruption, replied, I'm trying to put the ocean in this hole. And then it struck Augustine that he was behaving a lot like this little boy. He was trying to pour the ocean of truth about God into his little head. And he was having no more success than this little boy was with his bucket. So as when we try to figure God out and why God is doing certain things and why we go through the trials and testings of life, why he does what he does, and we don't understand suffering and pain, we don't understand why he allows Satan to steal and kill and destroy during this time. But one day, it'll all make sense. One day, we will see the purposes of God. And we will know that God is just and good and right because he is God. And we will sing with the tribulation saints. Because we will see that his works are remarkable. We will see that his ways are righteous. Even though his ways are beyond human comprehension and understanding. We will know that his ways are right. Verse 3 says, Just and true are thy ways, thou king of saints. We may not see it on earth. But in heaven we will know it for certain. Somebody once wrote this. He writes in characters too grand for our short sight to understand. We catch but broken strokes and try to fathom all the mystery of withered hopes of death, of life, the endless war, the useless strife. But there with larger, clearer sight, we shall see this. His way was right. If the tribulation saints were able to sing God's praise, if those who will experience unspeakable pain will be able to praise God and sing about how great and how right He is, we too will sing the praises of God. All of God's world will revere Him. All nations will come before Him and worship Him. Verse 4 says, Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, before the, for, for the judgments are made manifest. Everyone that has ever been born will one day bow the knee before the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who are so hostile towards the gospel... Those who ridicule the saints. Those who seek to tear down and destroy and laugh at us. Will one day bow the knee before the Lord Jesus Christ. And declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. Philippians chapter 2 says. At the name of Jesus. Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. John White a Christian psychologist talked about a time his one-year-old son, Scott, fell on a cement driveway. He split the area below his chin. The cut was so deep that the floor of his mouth was exposed. 
Hospitals and doctors were over 250 kilometers away, over tortuous mountain roads. Dr. White had no surgical instruments with him, and all he could find was one darning needle, some coarse thread, one pair of rather blunt scissors, and a pair of eyebrow tweezers. Dr. White knew that infection in children develops rapidly. Infection in the floor of the mouth can have fatal complications. They also had a little uh, sulfonamide powder, but there was no local anesthetic. Even so, he said, I decided to trim and stitch the wound with what we had. Dr. White sterilized the instruments, but he could not help but look at the uh, affair from his son Scott's point of view. Dr. White did his best to explain, but what can a one-year-old child fully understand about something like this? Then Scott placed him on the dining room table, and judgment descended on this little child. Cruel adult seized his limbs and his head so that movement was impossible. And then the father that he had trusted became a fearful monster, inflicting unbelievable pain on him. John said, how I wish that he could understand that I feared for his life. Mercifully, Dr. White said, he still seemed to trust me when it was all over. Sometimes our Heavenly Father allows us to experience unbelievable pain, something far beyond our ability to comprehend. But someday we will look back and we will see that everything he did was right. In the meantime, we need to trust him. That's the heavenly perspective during the Great Tribulation. And that's the perspective that we need in our own trials and tribulations. So now in the midst of your sorrow and pain, see the seven angels and the end of pain that will one day take place. See the sea of glass and the peace that is ours in the midst of pain. And finally, I believe in this chapter, we see a sanctuary in God's punishment for sin. We see the temple in heaven and know that God will make everything right in the end. Verse 5 says, And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. The temple of the tabernacle here is the holy of holies in heaven. It is the most holy place in heaven where God's law is kept and where God himself dwells. God's holiness demands justice. His righteousness requires that sin be punished. His integrity insists that all wrongs be made right. And that's exactly what will one day happen. Bible scholar Christopher Wright tells a moving story about a friend from India who came to faith in Christ by reading the Old Testament. At the time, he taught, he taught in an engineering school attached to a local university. But he'd grown up among the despised, the outcast in Indian culture. His whole family had suffered greatly. The hands of the high caste Hindus in the village. They suffered all kinds of harassment and, and violence and injustice. And he had a great thirst for revenge against his oppressors. And so he worked very hard at school to get to university so that he could get a job with some influence and power and then turn the tables on his enemies. The day he arrived at the university, he found a Bible translated into Telugu, his state language. He'd never read the Bible, though he knew that it was the Christian's holy book. He opened it at random and started reading the story of Naboth and Ahab in 1 Kings chapter 21. It's the story of unjust Ahab who uses his power to steal the land from Naboth, an ordinary farmer. The story had so many familiar elements that this young man said, this is my story. This is what my family has experienced at the hands of 
the higher caste. They'd experienced theft of land and false accusations and murders and brutality. But then he read on and he was amazed to find about another man called Elijah, who in the name of some God of the Bible denounced King Ahab and said that he would be judged and punished by his God. This was announced to this student from India. He had millions of gods within Hinduism that he could have chosen from. But none of his gods had taken his side growing up. Here was a God who took the side of the suffering ones and condemned the government and the powerful of their, for their wicked deeds. This young man said, I never knew that such a God existed. And as he continued to read the Bible, he learned about Jesus, his life and death and resurrection. He also learned that he needed to forgive. And he began the road towards faith, started by meeting God through the Old Testament. The God who takes the side of the oppressed. My friends, regardless of what you're going through right now, God is on your side. God sees what you're experiencing. He knows the pain you're going through. And God will one day make it all right. So in the midst of your trials and tribulations, try to get God's perspective on things. See these seven angels and the end of pain. See the sea of glass and the peace that will one day be ours and see a God who will one day make all things right. But even in the midst of all of this judgment, God's plea is for those who don't, do not know him to come to him by faith, to trust him as their personal savior. In 1902, Adelaide Pollard was going through what she described as a distress of the soul. She felt that God had called her to missionary service in Africa, but she was unable to raise the necessary funds. In her state of discouragement, she attended a little prayer meeting one night where an elderly woman prayed this. It really doesn't matter what you do with us, Lord. Just have your way with our lives. That night, Adelaide Pollard put her thoughts on paper. Five years later, in 1907, George Stebbins put those words to music, and they become one of the favorite hymns of this day. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. Perhaps you're experiencing this morning a distress of the soul. The same type that Adelaide Pollard described. I would urge you this morning to make her song the prayer of your heart today. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Father, we are thankful for this time together. I pray that you may help us that even as we study a book of judgment, that we would see your hand of grace and mercy in the midst of it, trying to get people's attention, trying to get people to come to you. Lord, I pray that in these days, though they be challenging, God, help us to understand that one day suffering will end. One day it will all make sense. God, I pray that you would help us to be faithful in doing the work that you've called us to do even in the midst of our suffering. We pray these things this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. In closing, we're going to sing In Times Like These. In times like these, you need a Savior. In times like these, you need. Oh,
Amen, folks. Remember, the office is open Wednesday morning. If you need to pop by or contact us, uh, you can certainly get a hold of us before then. Uh, most of you have Brenda's number and my number, so please feel free to do that. Uh, God bless you this week. Have a great week. And be salt and light for the Lord Jesus Christ in our community this week. And show forth the love of an awesome God. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Thank <laughs> you.